Good morning and uh, welcome to Portal's webinar discussing the future of enterprise planning. I'm joined uh, today by Sheree Messenger of Hiscox and Andy Nelms of IBM and we will be discussing how the enterprise planning product has evolved and where the future lies from both a customer perspective and a development perspective. Uh, before we start, I just want to set the agenda for the next hour. In a second, I will introduce the panel and then we'll hear from Shireen about how Hiscox have utilized the Cognos planning tools to meet the business objectives and hear how Hiscox are evolving with changes in demands and technologies to continue to meet their objectives. Andy will then tell us his plans for enterprise planning development and what he has done to push towards a more self-sufficient planning community. Following that, I will briefly explain why business partners are important in the IBM landscape and demonstrate where we add value. I would like to invite everybody to contribute to the discussions today by submitting questions in the webinar control panel. Questions will be collected during the discussions and we will answer as many as we can in the 10 minute Q&A slot towards the end of this session. Any unanswered questions will be taken away and uh, responded to individually. Uh, the format of this webinar is based on a series of questions that I'll be asking our speakers to address. So some of your questions may actually be answered uh, during the discussions with our guest speakers today. Finally, at the end of the session, I have some information about some upcoming events uh, that may be of interest and related to this. So uh, there will also be other pieces of useful information to help you achieve planning success now and in the future. So let's move on. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce today's panel. Uh, firstly, I've got uh, Shireen Messenger here from Hiscox. Shireen, would you mind introducing yourself and tell us a little about your background? Hello, everyone. Um, well, I worked my way up the accounting ladder in South Africa until I became a group management accountant for a large construction and engineering company. While there, I took over the running of their group consolidation and budgeting system. I made significant process and speed improvements to the system and was eventually headhunted by a financial software consultancy. I moved to the UK shortly after this and began working with the Datum, the original name of Cognos Planning by a consultancy partner, then spent several years working as a contractor and consultant. I've been the Cognos Competency Centre Manager at Hiscox for the last six years and look after over a thousand users in the UK, Europe and the US. Thank you, Shireen. Uh, we're also joined uh, today by Andy Nelms from IBM. Uh, Andy, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure, Molly. Uh, I started off as a management accountant, and I worked as a management accountant for about 10 years, really focusing on forecasting, budgeting, and analysis. And for the vast, sort of, say, the first eight years of that, really using spreadsheets to do it. Uh, towards at the, the end of my career, I, as, a, as a management accountant, I realized that spreadsheets really weren't good enough uh, to, to do planning. So I purchased a product called a datum and really moved all of our spreadsheet-based planning away in, into a datum. I liked the product so much I couldn't afford to buy the company, uh, but I did decide that I'd go and join the company. So I joined the datum as employee number 22 did various roles, both in services and sales in the UK and the US, and then uh, a datum got acquired by Cognos, and Cognos then in turn got acquired by IBM. So I think I'm at the end of the acquisition road now, uh, but uh, my, my current role is I'm product manager for planning and analysis. So I've got a team of people that look after the future of both Cognos planning and TM1. Thank you, number 22, and uh, I suppose I'd better say something uh, a little bit about my background too. Uh, I'm uh, Murray Pullin, and I'm the head of the uh, Analytics Center of Excellence at Portal. Uh, I first got involved with planning software as a customer when I worked at Legal & General as the financial planning uh, uh, manager, and quickly adopted the product due to its uh, ease of use and I was able to see many different use cases uh, to be used across the business, both in the finance department that I worked in and other departments across the business. Uh, before I knew it, I was working for the UK's largest Cognos partner and then continued to serve uh, the business analytics customer base on my own and with other business partners from my own company, Planet CPM. 
uh, portal uh, acquired Planet CPM in October 2012, where we are today. So let's get into uh, some detail, and uh, let's start by hearing about uh, the Hiscox story. Uh, Shireen, thanks for taking part in the webinar today. Uh, please, can you tell us uh, why you chose enterprise planning as your tool for planning at Hiscox? In 2006 at Hiscox, there were many spreadsheet processes, and plenty of time was spent each month preparing spreadsheets for the next run. So each spreadsheet was incredibly large. There were multiple spreadsheets required for each process, and the usual problems with spreadsheets were occurring. So there were formula errors, there were manual adjustment numbers that were overlooked, and due to several source systems, copying and pasting data out of these source systems had to happen into the various spreadsheets. There, if there were any hierarchical changes, uh, this caused maintenance nightmares, and there were version control issues as well. So due to all the work required to get spreadsheets into a fit state for use, deadlines were often missed. The finance director, directors and managers finally decided that enough was enough. A solution needed to be found. And after a beauty parade of the various budgeting and forecasting software on the market, EP was selected. It is easy to use, and there's much more control. Process time saved has been excellent. The data is easily extracted from source systems, and monthly maintenance is a breeze in comparison. So what they like best about it was that they are in control of their own models and are self-sufficient. Thank you, Jerry. I think uh, some common uh, themes there. I think we can all uh, resonate with some of those problems that you've had. Um, in terms of your estate, uh, can you uh, share with us uh, the scale uh, of the uh, enterprise client estate that you have and how many models you have at Hiscox and, and maybe what they're useful? We use Cognos Planning to do many of our financial calculations, like the expense allocations, management accounts, budgeting and forecasting, the group snapshot, accident year and underwriting triangles, rating indices, several actuarial calculations, one year forecasts, five year forecasts, branch and agency calculations, balance sheets and cash flows. The list goes on. At the last count, we have over 150 live analyst models and about 20 contributor models. That's uh, quite impressive, actually. Um, with with so many models, uh, libraries, applications, how do you how do you manage and support the different uh, areas? Given that you've got developers building models and applications uh, across uh, Hiscox. So at Hiscox, we've implemented a Cognos Competency Center, which focuses on supporting the different areas in their Cognos usage, but also gets the different areas talking to each other when they start building similar models to share ideas and also to stop replication of work that was prevalent in the spreadsheet world. We start with training the users. If they're going to build the models themselves, we would give them full analyst training, but if they only use EP for analysis, we'll give them a quick one-day overview of the basics. So things like what's a D-list, D-cube, D-link, drill down, etc. After that, we support them with internal consultancy. We either build models for the areas if they're short on resource, or we mentor them as they build the models themselves. Once they've worked with us on a couple of the model builds, they start building models by themselves, and we review them and implement any missed best practice. Then once the models are live, We'll support them via the, our internal Cognos help desk if something goes wrong with their model runs. It's, uh, it's an interesting concept, uh, Shireen, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we've uh, we've got something uh, to share with everybody else later on as one of the bits of useful information about setting up a competency centre. So uh, we'll uh, share with that later on. Uh, out of those models, uh, Shireen, uh, which of the models uh, has the most users and, and how many? At the moment, the expense model has approximately 500 users. It consists of contributor application and analyst models. The contributor workflow has uh, made things much easier in terms of managing this kind of high volume of user. We can easily see where each cost center is with its data entry, and it's easy to follow up when required. The end users like the look and feel of it because it's reminiscent of the spreadsheets and pivot tables we hardly need to deal with the end users. 
at the expense super users are fully self-sufficient and actually land uh, training the end users themselves. Uh, thank you. And uh, out of all those models, uh, which is the largest in terms of uh, cells or volume? And uh, how how do you manage uh, any limitations that you might have with those uh, with those models? So the expense allocation model is the largest, and it's complex due to the alloc the allocation process, but also due to how we had to get the model uh, to, you know, or how we had to design the model to get it to work efficiently as possible. We had to do this by splitting cubes out, and even these split cubes are, are very big. So um, it so we also have problems exporting it out of planning and getting it into BI. We, we have major issues with the publishing uh, it kept on failing. So basically we have to do that now via text files. And these exports take several hours. I would say that this model definitely pushes EP to its limits. Uh, it's good to see that some of these are uh, actually straining the product uh, always gives us a bit of a challenge. Um, but when you're looking at uh, other, other planning products like Team One, what, what are the factors um, that are driving you to, to, to look at these products uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the business factors that are affecting you on a day-to-day -day or month-by-month -month basis? Uh, I would say that um, what's attracting us most uh, to TM1 uh, is the real-time reporting between TM1 and Cognos BI, uh, take, taking out uh, the, the time that we actually spend trying to transfer the models would significantly help us. We've also had many issues, um, as I mean, we use SSIS as well as publishing at the moment, just trying to, to shift the data across. So if, if we could get rid of that, it would be great. Also, uh, cubes that uh, can have billions of cells would really reduce the complexity of our current model designs, making it generally easier to understand uh, from a high level when people look at what's going on. We have been watching the development of TM1 over the past few years, and it's becoming very similar from a front-end perspective to EP, so our super users would feel much more comfortable using it. In the past, we were really concerned that the rules and feeders would literally rule out our end users from using TM1, but this is not the case anymore. And TM1 would allow our areas of the business to be self-sufficient as they are now, but with faster, more integrated models. That's uh, great stuff, uh, Shane. Thank you um, uh, for uh, clearing some of those things up uh, today and uh, some great insight into how to expand and spread the cost of investment across the business with, uh, with the Comedy Center. Uh, Andy, um, I know that you've uh, worked with Shireen and Hiscox for many years. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add to the Hiscox story? Yeah, definitely, Murray. So Hiscox has been great as one of the members of the Customer Advisory Board. Shireen represents Hiscox at that and comes along and talks to us about how Hiscox as a company wants to develop the Cognos planning product. and. We, we listen to advice from uh, Hiscox and other customers at, at those advisory boards, and, and that helps drive our development strategy. But uh, she already touched on it earlier, but that's another area where she's given us uh, invaluable help from her, some of her team from Hiscox, is, along with some other Cosmos planning customers as well, is helping us drive the development of TM1. We knew one of the big uh, problems with, with TM1 was getting people to move from Cosmos planning to TM1 was the ease of use of TM1. And as we put things into TM1 to make it much easier to use, we've looked for, to Shireen and others for feedback on is it doing the job. And she gives us tough feedback sometimes, but that's been really useful in helping us accelerate our development program to make TM1 a much easier product to use. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, OK, so before we move on, I just need to show a disclaimer from IBM to clarify the information shared by IBM in presentations and events like this uh, about the future of products are not intended to be relied upon for purchasing decisions. Uh, also, any information about features with regards to release dates or upcoming features are solely held at IBM's discretion. Uh, in the bottom section there, there's a little bit about performance. I don't think we'll be talking too much about the statistics uh, about performance. Uh, 
today, so um, it, it's up there for you to have a, a quick read. Uh, don't forget, if you do have any questions for Shireen, Andy, or myself, uh, please post them using the chat functionality in the webinar window. Uh, so, uh, Andy, uh, let's move on to the work that you've done and uh, potentially what's coming up in the future. Firstly, um, I'd like to go back a bit when you worked at Cognos. Can you um, can you share with us what why Cognos acquired Applix? Yeah, sure. We were actually very happy with the way development was going with Cognos planning for a lot of the reasons Shireen has already touched on. Um, we we had, I, I think, our unique differentiators where we had a very easy to use product for people like me who were business users, accountants, were self-sufficient and could build their own models without having to have specialized programmers to do it. And we also had great user scalability with our distributed front end. We, we had we had a fantastic story on, on user scale. So again, Hiscox were able to talk about their expense model. Very easy to scale out to 500 users. But as Shireen touched on earlier, where we had weaknesses was when there was a lot of data in the models, very big cubes either for analysis or as Shireen talked about with allocations. And so what one of the things that appealed to us about TM1 was it handled much bigger data volumes than, than analysts did it in Cognos planning. So that, that was one of the reasons. And then another Shireen touched on as well, actually, was, was the live reporting. So a lot of you will have your data in Cognos planning models, and you might even be using some of the more recent features like incremental publish to take that out to relational and then put reporting on top. That works very well for some of our customers, but uh, there was a significant number of customers who were talking, as Shireen did, about the really wanting the need for live reporting. And so we, we could see that if we acquired TM1 with, with, the, with the OLAP engine, it would be much easier for us to put BI directly on top of TM1. So those were really some of the drivers behind the acquisition. Thank you. Um, so what are the, uh, in the work that you've been doing, what are the key developments uh, in enterprise planning uh, that you've been working on over the, the last few years, and uh, how does that look for the future? So, as you can see for, from the graph, it, it, if we go back to Cosmos Planning uh, 8.2, the, the big thing on that, that was really following uh, Cosmos' acquisition of the datum. So, I think we went from about version 3 to version 8. There was definitely some marketing on there uh, to get us up to the same BI number. But the really key thing in that, in that release was taking advantage of a lot of the platform strengths that Cognos had. So it freed up our developers to focus on planning and, and how we were going to make that better and, and really making use of a lot of the BI architecture that already existed. Then uh, in 8.4, we added the, the rich client. There was a lot of other stuff as well, but the main thing about that was, was the rich client. So fantastic new front end for the contributors. Uh, really good user scale and um, big cut down on the admin in, in terms of you didn't have to have uh, um, admin rights on the local PC to, to, get, to get that client deployed. As we move on to 10.1, one of the big things in that was really a focus on user scale, on, on, on scalability. So we, we weren't trying to replicate uh, a TM1 but we did significant work to make the models much much better for data scale. And we, we changed the way we sliced up our models for the contributor style model. So it was much more efficient. And then in 10.1.1, we put in the work to, uh, up until then, if you were using BI on top of Cognos planning, you had to have the same release number. And from things like the customer advisory board, we got significant feedback that people quite often wanted to go at a different pace in upgrading their planning side to upgrading their BI. So we started to do the work to, to uh, break that, that, that link so that now in the more recent versions of planning and BI, you're able to upgrade at different speeds. I know one of the reasons that I focused on enterprise planning over the years was its ease of use and being able to empower customers to develop models. Uh, and when I first looked at TM1 several years ago, uh, I was put off by what I saw. Um, 
I think that's quite a common thing for the enterprise planning community as well. So what have you done to the TM1 product to make it easier to use? Yeah, the, the main thing we've done, and I'll, I'll touch on this, uh, some of this stuff later, but the main thing we've done is we've added a component called performance modeler. So if you're coming from a Cognos planning background, in order to build an application, you, you build the model in Analyst and what you'd like about it with the simple dimensions, cubes, and links are very, as Shireen touched on earlier, very, very simple for a business user like me, someone who's, who's a power spreadsheet user in their time, to build a model. And then to roll it out to lots of people, you, you publish it up to the admin console and put in security and roll it out there. In, in TM1, to, to replicate that, what we did was take perform, add a new component called Performance Modeler so that we took the familiar concepts of dimensions, cubes, and links uh, and actually make that the way to build models in TM1. So what we've tried to do is keep both user bases happy. So for people coming from Cognos Planning now, I don't think there's ever been a better time to come from Cognos Planning to TM1 you're going to see a very, very familiar front end for building your model, and you're going to see familiar concepts such as dimension calculations. But you can also, we've taken that concept further, and there are things like cube calculations, which have got the same simplicity, but much more flexibility than you had in Cognos Planning. But for people, um, for our TM1 base, the, the, there's many people who've gone through the learning curve of being able to write uh, complex rules and processes with, with, a, with the scripting languages that we use for that, and we've kept that there in Performance Modeler. So if you come from a TM1 heritage, you can carry on building models the way you used to. Uh, we would recommend you look at the new ways because it, it's, it's much easier, but uh, you, you don't have to move. Um, but for people coming from a Cognos Planning or a spreadsheet background, you can see a very, very simple way to build models. Is that okay, Mike? Yeah, thank you, Andy. Uh, you probably saw on the screen that uh, we were flicking through some uh, examples of TM1 uh, and or performance modeler and analyst uh, in the foreground. Uh, so hopefully uh, that, that caught your attention so you can see how, how similar uh, the products are, are now becoming. Um, Andy, back over to you. I just want to uh, Hopefully, you can clarify some other areas of, uh, that could cause some confusion. TM1 is, is made up of lots of components, um, and enterprise planning was, was relatively simple, right? So if, would you be able to give a quick overview uh, of the components of TM1 and explain what role they play in the technology stack and how you've been uh, investing in them? Certainly, Murray. So I think we've got a slide that helps with that. Um, can you see the right-hand side, actually, as well? There we go. I can see that. So if, if you look at this, if, this kind of architecture view of the world, we've got performance modeler that I was talking about earlier so that we can see we, the power users can see. Uh, so the power users can, can very easily build their models. Um, then we've got a, a choice of clients for end users. And I would not say that any customer would be using all four clients. You choose the right client for the right application, and many customers will only use one of the end user clients. But we've got a choice of four. So we've got the rich client, which is called Cognos Insight. For people coming from a Cognos planning background, we've basically used the same trick that we used with Cognos planning to get much better user scalability. So we have a distributed client where all the calculations are done on the on the local PC, and so as more and more people are using a particular application, you're not stressing the server because the calculations are being done locally, so that's how we get really good user, user scalability and really good performance over a WAN. Well, back in the Cosmos planning days, I don't think it's any different with what I'm seeing with, with TM1, is there's a real split between user communities of whether they want to use Excel or not. There's some users that have uh, been burnt, quite frankly, with Excel, and so really don't want to have an Excel front end. Um, but there's, there's, there's plenty of customers out there as well who recognize that maybe the reason they were burnt with Excel is, is the lack of uh, maintenance, 
the difficulty to string loads of spreadsheets together. But when you have a powerful OLAP engine like TM1 behind an Excel front end, a lot of the weaknesses of Excel go away. So they still want their end users to be able to work in Excel. So what we've done recently with that, with the 10.2 release that came out back in September, was we took the existing Cognos uh, Excel front end called CAFE and made that a first class citizen of TM1. So now that's a, a read-write front end with two different modes. One's an exploration mode for, the, for analysis where you can slice and dice and one's um, a mode where you can where you have you, you can have a much more custom front end and relies on and rely on Excel formulae. In addition to that, we ha we've still got the old TM1 perspectives front end, and a lot of the things that people really love about that the the TM1 based formulae that that we're now putting into the into the new cafe front end. So so again, trying to keep users who've come from the, the traditional applets heritage happy and people are coming more from the cognitive planning or more of a business users using spreadsheets environment. The 10.2 release was also a big step forward in our thin front end. So for customers that don't want to have a rich client, don't want to have an Excel client, we have a very, very good web client. And there was, for, for people who were used to the old TM1 client uh, for this, there were, there were big step forward, both in terms of performance and in the way that it renders the views. So m much better user scalability, much better performance over a WAN, but just a really, really much crisper look and feel. And that's gone down very well in the last few months with, with customers. And then we also, in the 10.2 release, uh, put in a new front end, the mobile front end. So again, a read-write front end for contributor models. So that for people with an iPad who wanted to contribute to a TM1 application, they were able to do so. So that really is how we look after our end users. And we've also got the approval hierarchy um, for contributor style applications, really pretty, pretty much identical to how you're used to it in Cognos Planning. Then we've Really, as, as TM1 has become more and more successful, what we find is with our bigger customers, they might have 50, 60 cases of hundreds of different servers all over the world, TM1 servers all over the world. And we were getting a lot of feedback that it was getting hard for a central person to administer those servers. So we introduced another component back in 10.1 called the Operations Console that makes, makes it much easier to monitor lots of different servers wherever they, wherever they are and we're continuing to develop that. Then the TM1 server itself has been subject to really big, big investment. So people will see things like multi, multi-threaded query coming in in, in 10.2, and before that, parallel interaction, which gives us much better user scalability and, again, much better performance over a WAN. Um, in terms of APIs and services, we're, we're working on making it much easier for third-party application builders to use our API. And in the 10.2 release, we introduced uh, scorecarding uh, as, a, as, an, an, as a, a much easier way to build scorecarding directly on top of TM1. So reusing Performance Modeler and Cognos Insight in order to be able to build scorecards directly in TM1. Uh, I'll touch on later as, as well, we, we also made it easier, we introduced for the first time having TM1 on the cloud, so you don't have to have an on-premise implementation anymore, if you want us to manage that for you, you've got the option of implementing TM1 on the cloud. No. Thank you Andy, um, uh, some, uh, Hopefully that's clarified uh, a few of the uh, un uncertainties out there. And, and I think it's fair to say that um, it seems like there's a, a TM1 old and TM1 new. So uh, it sounds like things are, are changing, which is, uh, I, think, I think, good for uh, most people involved on this call today. Uh, Andy, uh, another question for you. Um, having worked with a business partner model with a data man Cognos, uh, in the past, what, what's IBM's view on, on working with uh, business partners? 
IBM invests significantly in our business partner network, and it's very much of our strategy for the mid-market to, to work through business partners. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time in working with our partners to make them successful, but we believe that uh, a, a vibrant partner network gives us a real strength in reaching out to more customers and giving them more individual service than we, than, we, than we could possibly do if we just relied on our own channel. Thank you, Andy. Um, I, I think it's a, a fair point. That I, I know that IBM do support us uh, as a business partner. And for me personally, I think the most important factor uh, about um, introducing business partners into the mix uh, is certainly one of relationships. And by that, I mean strengthening and our relationships with customers, both IBM's customers and, and business partners. Um, as you can see uh, from the slide I've put up here, uh, the link between customers and IBM isn't often linked directly, and the direct interaction lies solely with the business partner and the customer in most cases. Uh, I believe the model works well, and uh, the vendor and distri distributor support the business partner well, leaving business partners focused with the customer. Um, as uh, business partners are much smaller businesses anyway, and uh, they tend to be a little bit more agile and reactive to customer needs, uh, making sure that the customer gets most out of the software solution that they've invested in. Uh, I know from working as a, a consultant uh, for business partners and uh, independently supplying services to customers, that different business partners have different views on making their business successful. For me, the success factor is being able to continue to empower customers with uh, becoming self-sufficient uh, with the technology, as we've already discussed, and also to work closely with IBM and the customers to ensure the customers get the best service possible in terms of ensuring that they are developing models, uh, doing to best practice, and configuring software in line with internal IT policies to ensure that they get, get the best performance out of their uh, models, and advising on hardware improvements. Um, we, we're able to support both the environment and applications uh, that have been rolled up and, uh, or, and, and providing services to help customers design their solutions uh, for their ever-changing uh, in, in, uh, ever business. So uh, an another factor that, that needs to be uh, considered is, is knowledge. Um, by that I mean product knowledge and industry knowledge and also understanding uh, what the customers are actually trying to achieve uh, by adopting the software. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're trying to make a process run more effectively. And it's not often a, a product problem that's being solved, it's a business problem. Uh, our consultants at Portal have come from different backgrounds, whether that be a technical background or finance background, uh, where we have qualified accountants and part qualified accountants in the team and all have a general business background. Uh, the ability to solve a business problem in line with product knowledge and having strong relationships with IBM help us offer more to our customers. Uh, Portal as well, we, we also have uh, a dedicated support desk uh, to better serve our customers, making us one of the few business analytics partners that, that do that. Uh, this is structured in a way to quickly distribute queries to the correct support representatives and to respond effectively, effectively to resolve any issues. It's very common for a, for a customer to end up working with one or two key individuals in our support team, creating an even better working relationship for customers who need to use portal support services. Now, Andy Shrain, is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? No, no. Excellent. So we have uh, received a couple of questions uh, coming in um, over the last couple of minutes. If you do have any more to uh, submit, then uh, do so now. Um, I will uh, start uh, by working through it. We've probably got about 15 minutes to work through these questions. So uh, I'll start. I've got one here for uh, Shireen. Um, Shireen, uh, would you be able to uh, tell us how you uh, built up uh, the competency center at, at Hiscox. Okay, well basically uh, I, I used uh, some of the IBM online re resources 
there was a very good diagram um, that uh, basically had all the, the various areas um, that a Cognos Competency Centre or Centre of Excellence should focus on. And we have um, pretty much used that as our Bible over the last few years. It covers things that I've already chatted uh, to you all about, things like internal consultancy, best practice, uh, training, a help desk. Um, there's evangelizing in the business as well um, so that uh, you know, the product can spread out into departments that may not use it. There's also working with data governance, which we're, we're doing a, a lot more of these days, and being involved in um, IT governance as well. So slowly over the years, we've definitely been expanding into these various areas as we go. Uh, I have also spoke to other companies who implemented Center of Excellences or something similar. And um, we, we sharing the information um, between all of us has been very helpful. We've, we've got some great ideas over the years uh, from other companies. Uh, we also try and speak to our main internal customers on an annual basis to see how we need to address our service to meet their needs more efficiently. So all of this has helped in um, how it's slowly evolving over time. Okay, thank you, Shireen. Um, Andy, I've handed you a, a few questions there. Um, I'll uh, pass, uh, pass the mic over to you. So first question is, what is the migration path to move from Cognos Planning to TM1? I think that really varies for different customers. A lot of customers go through a stage where they build some things that are best suited to uh, TM1 in TM1. And we're seeing now we've really cut down with the work we've done on performance modeler and Cognos Insight to actually be using TM1 and Cognos Planning together is much easier than it's ever been. There's, there's not a lot of difference for someone coming from the Cosmos Planning product to learn those to learn those two. So we see some customers really using each product uh, aside, side by side and, and choosing which is, which is best for each thing. We've seen quite a few customers actually now migrate from Cosmos Planning fully to, to TM1. Uh, recently, uh, in the 10.2 release that came out in September to help with that, we introduced a migration tool that takes the Cognos Planning, the Cognos Planning XML from your contributor model and creates a first pass of the TM1 model for you. I, I really liken that to kind of like a Google translation. If you, you, know, if you write English into Google and, and, you, and you do a Google translation into French, a French person is probably going to understand you, but probably not be that ex uh, pleased with the with the words that you come up with or the or the accent that you speak it with. It's not going to create a fully optimized TM1 model, but it is a start. And we've actually had some customers be pretty successful with that. Although it's not creating a truly optimized uh, TM1 model, it's been good enough for them to to carry on. And actually, they use use that with their live model. So the, the migration tool is well worth looking at, but don't think of it as a turnkey solution. Think of it as something that can help you uh, judge how much migration you judge the size of the path that you've got and, and, and a, helping, a helping start. So I've got another question here. Uh, yeah, so another question is, how did the Team structure change after the switch to TM1. Is it is understood TM1 is a much more technical product and life as a developer much more complex? Did the staff migrate? So what when we acquired TM1, what that allowed us to do was uh, get the the people from Netflix really focused on the TM1 server uh, and the the engine, and there's, there's been significant developments on that. We, we did take quite a few other people from other parts of Cognos to work on the new front ends that we talked about earlier. So we've taken, we've taken the cafe front end and, and made that a first class citizen of TM1. And the Cognos Insight front end really was built on top of using, using a lot of the, the code and the development team from the, from the old rich client in Cognos Planning. So, so yes, some you know some of our staff did migrate to 
to work on on PM1. Um, the next question is: If we are to develop best of both, can we expect more simplification of PM1 maintenance features? So can menu driven? So can menu driven rather than scripted? Yeah. So. Our first focus has been to make it much, much easier to build a model in in TM1. So performance modeler is how we've done that with the introduction of things like cube calculations and dimension calculations and, that, and links that can drive both rules and TI. So that, that's been the first focus. You, you, in, in subsequent releases, you will see us focusing on making it much easier to, to create TI that is used for, for maintenance. But even in the first few releases, we've had the principle of, wherever possible, we've automated the automation. So if you import a dimension, or you import a cube, or you import data, we actually create the TI for you that you can then use if you want to repeat that process. So we've already done significant work on that, but I agree there's, there's, there's more needed to do. The next question is, do you have insight to how many projects are using performance modeler? Most TM1 developers prefer to use old methods. As they say, PM produces cumbersome code that needs tweaking. They, uh, yeah, they're spreading this harmful message. So, first of all, I, I don't, I'm not on a mission to stop people who've invested many years into learning how to write complex TM1 rules and TM. TI script. With performance modeler, we, we, we allow people to carry on doing that. Maybe we, we, haven't, we haven't done a good enough job at, at making it clear to people that you can carry on in performance modeler uh, writing those scripts. You don't have to use the easier, easier components. But I would strongly recommend to people that they, they do that because for, for model maintenance, it's much easier to take over a model from someone else when it's been built using links and formulae that are easy to understand written in business language than, than in the equivalent script. So I, I think we will see people moving to that. And, and again, the, 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 what you saw in the difference between the 10.1 and the 10.2 releases, yeah, in the 10.1 release, some of the, some of the rules that we created from, from formulae uh, weren't necessarily the most efficient rules and certainly not the most efficient feeders. If you look at the 10.2 release that came out in September, much, much tighter. Um, so really, really good, good, good scripts being produced. So I think that will continue to evolve. So we've got a question on all the components. So it says all these components seem quite scary, especially compared to some of the cloud-based planning providers such as Anaplan. Is this a concern you see in your prospective clients? So I would say, as a general point, that we are seeing now a split in the market in that the, the cloud really is here. And that's why in 10.2, we, we produced the cloud version of TM1. So for customers who don't want to have to do all that installation, themselves and and have the different components uh, and some of the you know some of the, the the cost of ownership issues that you have with an on-premise release we we do have a cloud option and they're, they're clearly vendors such as Anaplan that, that have a that have a that option as well and I think you will see in the marketplace more and more cloud providers appearing and you'll see us investing heavily in the cloud um, in terms of all the components. We we do make customers. We this is probably where it's good to work with your partner. Choose the right components for you. You don't have to use all of them. I wouldn't expect you know if we take the example of the end user component, I wouldn't expect any customer to be using all four. You you use the one that makes most sense for you. So I think the next one is a question for Shireen. Okay, so the question is, with so many contributor and analyst models, what sort of plan will you be implementing to roll out your next product, um, i.e. TM1, and migrate your models over to the new product? Will you be parallel running models and doing this in stages? 
does that mean you will need to uh, significantly increase architecture and infrastructure? So uh, we're doing an on-put install at the moment. And the intention is to uh, put our um, the critical models that need to or that we would like to move over to TM1 um, into non-prod, um, you know, obviously build them up in TM1 and, um, and, and see how they perform for us. So that's where we are at the moment in terms of the, the increase in architecture and whatever's going to happen in production. I think that um, we will know more at the end of our investigations in non-prod. And it looks like the last one. Uh, when was the last release of Cognos Planning? Uh, that was Q4 in December. So we bought out uh, a fixed pack there. And bearing in mind the earlier disclaimer, <laughs> what can you tell us about the, the next release for Cognos Planning? So we met with the customer advisory board. It was back in December, wasn't it, I think, Shereen? And a lot of the feedback we were getting from that was really some performance improvements in the admin console that you were looking for. And I think that will be the main focus on the next release, and I'd expect that, that to see that in about 12 months' time. But again, the disclaimer, we don't really talk about futures. So if this is the time to quickly type in a question, if, you have any, if you've got any more that you want to ask, because we've run out here. Thank you, Andy. Uh, okay, so uh, just give it a couple more seconds, uh, but uh, uh, thank Andy and uh, Shireen for uh, uh, those uh, answers to those questions, and, and, and thank you for, for sending them in. Um, I think we'll, we'll move on. Um, if there's anything else that uh, anybody else wants to pose any more questions, uh, you can do so uh, with the details that will be put up on the last slide uh, today. So. Uh, I just want to close off the session with some uh, key points um, uh, made during the webinar, and then we can talk about some of the upcoming events and materials for you to learn more and develop your own businesses to get better returns on your investment. I think it's fair to say that the enterprise planning community is valuable to both IBM and business partners, and uh, we, we will all be supporting uh, these customers uh, no matter if they, they choose to go to uh, TM1 or enterprise planning. Uh, Portal will continue to support customers who are on unsupported platforms too, providing that the customers are happy to take on the risks of not being covered by IBM product support. Uh, we do recommend though that if, if you are wanting to uh, use future uh, features that will come out with later versions, then you know, staying on the latest version does have its, uh, its benefits. Uh, Andy has uh, made it very clear that there is continued development with enterprise planning, and uh, he will be ensuring that there is conformance with changes that are beyond IBM's control. So we're talking about things like operating systems, uh, that, that uh, and, and uh, office uh, links and things like that, that. That enterprise planning will need to change. So I think it's fair to say that Andy will be continuing to work on that. Uh, IBM Cognos Express does have full functionality of TM1 and BI, uh, but does have restrictions in terms of uh, users and number of uh, instances. Uh, it also has a low entry point in terms of price, so it's very competitive with uh, some of those other planning products that are either like Anaplan that was mentioned earlier, and uh, there are a few others out there that you may have come across. Uh, but again, I, I, I will reiterate, it does have full TM1 development capabilities, making it very strong from a feature perspective. It's also fair to say that uh, Andy is taking TM1 development tools towards what enterprise planning is well known for, uh, which is self-sufficiency. Uh, the time to move has never been better, and, and if you would like to see the product in action, then let us know and we will follow up with you after the event. Uh, the tools have reduced the learning curve, and, and hopefully screenshots showing the product side by side help to raise confidence that enterprise planning users should you decide to go down the TM1 or Express route, are more than halfway there. Uh, Shireen highlighted how the setup of a competence center has helped spread the cost of ownership across the business and still control, maintain, and manage a huge estate of libraries and applications. And finally, I explained how working with the business partner community does add value to the IBM customer relationship. So there are uh, a few events coming up that are related to this webinar. Um, 
next Thursday. Uh, there is a webinar on improving forecasting reliability uh, with integrating SPSS and TM1. Bear in mind that TM1 has been mentioned here, but I'm sure the principles can be adopted with enterprise planning in the same way, so it could be worth a look. The slides will have hyperlinks, or they actually do have hyperlinks, so uh, when you receive them, uh, you can click on the links to register. On the 19th of March, uh, there is Business Analytics Live, uh, which takes place at IBM South Bank in London. Uh, I do know that this is filling fast, so if you haven't registered already and would like to, then do a search on the web for Business Analytics Live 2014 and follow the link there. Um, it's Again, like I said, spaces are limited, uh, so if, if rather than waiting for the slides, if you want to do that today, uh, or uh, then you've got a better chance of getting on that. Uh, if you fancy getting involved in a larger event, uh, then register for the Vision event in Orlando in May. Uh, this is the place to get the latest news on what's going on in the world of financial and operational performance management. There will be plenty of use cases and customer presentations, so if you want to get out of the office for, for a few days, get a bit of sunshine, then this is the place to be seen. And finally, uh, the Finance Forum. Uh, this is a must for uh, anyone in finance and I wouldn't miss it for the world. Uh, I don't have registration details yet but I'm hoping to get something sent out in the next few days so put a placeholder in your calendar for the 11th of June. I've also got uh, uh, some, uh, James thank you for uh, adding to the chat there. There is uh, another event, a tier one proof of concept workshop at South Bank uh, which is on the 5th of March. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take that away, James, and I'll send something out uh, as well uh, to everybody who's attended today. Uh, the uh, Finance Forum, uh, by the way, is, is, as I mentioned, on the 11th of June, and that will be, on, uh, that will be at South Bank again. I, when, that does, when the registration does come out, register early, because that does fill up very, very fast. So over the next few days, you will receive an email containing a link to the webinar replay and a copy of the slides where you can use the hyperlinks to access the other assets on this slide. Uh, if you want to get a feel for the power of the latest business analytics uh, tools, then go to the Analytics Zone website and download a free version of the Insight software. You won't be able to use this as a production tool, but you will get a great sense of its capabilities and the power of the drag and drop interface to build, cubes and import data in one swipe. If you want to go a little bit further, you can uh, download Cognos Express for a trial period and really get stuck into the TM1 functionality and compare that with the enterprise planning software. And finally, IBM have a section on their website about setting up an analytic center of excellence with a white paper to support the thinking behind this concept. So we have uh, we've finished uh, ahead of schedule, which is probably good news for anybody with an 11 o'clock today. So. I'd like to thank you all for attending today's session, and I hope uh, you have some useful uh, takeaways there. Uh, I would also like to thank the, uh, I'd also like to thank Shireen and Andy for uh, taking part in today's event. And uh, uh, Andy, thanks, and Shireen, thanks for your contributions today. Uh, goodbye for now, and we will be in touch in the next few days.